I think the amount of inflation that the Federal Reserve is going to unleash in order to try to uh, counteract this uh, financial crisis. I mean, people are still reluctant to call it a financial crisis. That's exactly what it is, except it's bigger in scale and it's going to be far more impactful than the 2008 crisis. And it's probably going to result in even more uh, aggressive and reckless monetary and fiscal policy. And this time, it's going to take the dollar's reserve status down with it. So uh, I think that's going to really complicate things here in the U.S. because that's going to send inflation much, much higher and American standards of living uh, much lower. There's always a risk for every country that issues a fiat currency. Hyperinflation is always a risk. The question is, how high is the probability? You know, because not all risks end up, uh, you know, to fruition. So we could avoid it. But I think the risk is a lot higher now than it's ever been. And in order to avoid that outcome, it's going to require some very uh, difficult political decisions and choices that need to be made to avert that outcome. But I think even if we manage to avoid hyperinflation, you know, something like Zimbabwe or, you know, Weimar Republic, Germany, some of the really big examples where, you know, you need wheelbarrows full of money, uh, you know, to buy a pack of gum or something like that. You know, it's a possibility. It's hard to handicap how high a probability. But I do think that we're going to have very high inflation for many years to come. I mean, elevated double digit inflation and where the first digit may not be a one could be larger than a one. Right. So it's going to be very substantial inflation, even if it doesn't technically qualify as hyperinflation. But that's not, you know, uh, ruled out. So you have to be vigilant and be prepared because that worst case scenario may in fact be the scenario that ends up playing out. Thanks to the Fed's policies, as well as a government regulation and the moral hazards that it creates, the entire banking system is completely insolvent, including the too big to fail banks. All those banks would fail if the government stepped out of the way. But the reason our financial system is so vulnerable and, and, and so leveraged and insolvent is because of government. And now you have politicians trying to claim that the problems for Silicon Valley Bank or Signature Bank were the result of a lack of regulation or deregulation, when in fact the opposite is true. It was excessive regulation. That is the reason that the banks got into this predicament in the first place. And of course, without the Fed holding interest rates so low for so long, they wouldn't have even been able to have uh, loaded up their balance sheet with all this debt. But all the banks have done this. I mean, think about the mortgage market. How many Americans over the last you know, five or 10 years have successfully refinanced their mortgages to have rates in the threes? That is a huge gain for the borrower, but that comes at an enormous loss for the lender who is now stuck with that low yielding paper in a much higher and rising interest rate environment. So all the banks are going to lose a fortune as a result of owning these mortgages. And they will fail unless the governments bail them out by creating more inflation, which is ultimately how the bailouts are paid for. In fact, the Fed has already returned to quantitative easing, whether they want to call it that or not. But the balance sheet is up about 400 billion uh, since this financial crisis began. And it's going to get a lot bigger in order for the Fed to postpone the pain of the crisis and socialize it into a different form of pain, which will be higher prices, because that is what's the substitute. So on the one hand, the government says, don't worry about your bank account. We're going to guarantee it. But on the other hand, you now have to worry about the value of the money that's deposited in your bank, because even though the bank might not fail and you won't lose your money, when you go to spend your money, you won't be able to buy very much because your money is going to lose its purchasing power. There's no question that just like there's going to be a run on the banks, meaning people are trying to get their money out of the banks, they're going to be running to put it into gold uh, because no money is safe now in the bank uh, because either your bank is going to fail and you will lose your money or your bank won't fail because the government bails it out and your money will lose its purchasing power. So either way, you should withdraw your money now, but don't stick it under your mattress because it's going to lose purchasing power there too. You've got to convert it to real money. You've got to turn it into gold. Now, if banks could offer you a high enough rate of interest to offset the inflation, then that might be an incentive to leave the money in the bank. 
but the banks can't do that because they can't afford it because they're broke, because they've already locked up all their deposits in long-term low-yielding mortgages and treasuries, so they can't pay you enough to offset the loss of inflation, but they can't stop you from withdrawing your money. The problem is they don't have the money because the money has been lost. That's what happened to Silicon Valley Bank or Signature Bank. So as more people rush to withdraw their money from banks and use it to buy gold, the Federal Reserve is going to have to print more money to enable those withdrawals, which is going to create even more inflation, which is going to accelerate the appeal of gold and cause even more people to deplete their bank accounts to buy gold. And then it's a vicious circle of you know collapsing banks and runaway inflation. We will absolutely return to a gold standard. I mean, a gold standard has been uh, the monetary system that has dominated through most of recorded human history. And I don't think that that's changed. I think we've temporarily experimented with fiat currency. The experiment is going to end in disaster and it will prompt a return to what works, and that is gold. And whether it's governments or the private sector that lead the way, ultimately that's where we're gonna go. And we don't need governments to remonetize gold. Uh, the private sector can do it all by itself. In fact, gold was money in the private sector before uh, it became money in the public sector. You know, uh, It became money for the kings because that was the money that everybody wanted. That was if you wanted to pay your guards, you needed to pay them in money that they could use to buy food. And the farmer wanted gold. And so that's what the kings uh, collected in taxes. They, they collected gold so they could pay, pay their soldiers, right? But I think what would happen now is private enterprises, private businesses, whether it's uh, a bank or any other institution, doesn't even have to be a financial institution, but it has to be capable of holding custody of gold. It can then digitize, tokenize that gold, put it on a blockchain or other you know, form and allow individuals to own those tokens and then transact in them on the internet uh, instantaneously for a low cost. They can price goods and services in grams of gold. Uh, they can pay for and be paid in grams of gold and gold can circulate uh, easily around the globe as money, as a unit of account, as a medium of exchange and as a store of value. And so I think we're headed in that direction as far as uh, what the Chinese may do to the extent that they may decide that they want to back their currency by gold, make it redeemable into gold. I think that would be a very prudent move on their part. If if they're interested in having the dominant currency in the world, that would be a way to secure that position. I mean, the power has been shifting for quite some time. And if you look at the relationship between the United States and China, China is clearly the rising power and we are the declining power. Um, China enjoys an enormous trade surplus with the United States. China has the industrial capacity that we that we lack that we, we lost over the years. So uh, the real production and wealth creation is taking place over there. And all we're doing is buying what they produce and borrowing the money they save to pay for it. So I think we have this phony economy that has been propped up by inflation and, and cheap debt, and it's in the process of collapsing. And when the dollar loses its reserve status, that'll be the final nail in the coffin. And I think the American standard of living is going to plunge because the dollar is going to collapse and prices are going to soar. And we're not going to be able to import what the rest of the world produces. Now, the rest of the world, if they don't export their production to the United States, well, they're going to have more for themselves. So Americans are going to have to do make do with less. But the rest of the world is going to suddenly find that they have a lot more. And so while our standard of living goes down, outside the United States, particularly in the emerging markets, the standards of living are going to go way up.